You're listening to Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Hi, my name is Barbara Menes george and I am a sustainability communications expert based in Brussels, Belgium. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Let's Talk Sustainable Business, a series brought to you by the Conference Board. This is the second installment of our two-part episode with Margot Golibieska, Team Leader for Environmental Footprint and Green Claims at the DG Environment European Commission. If you haven't listened to part one yet, please do go back into our catalogue and listen to that one first. Welcome back, Margot Jatta, to part two. Hello. Hi. In this episode, I'd love to talk to you more about how the EU Green Claims Directive proposal will affect businesses. But first, I wanted to come back to a point you raised in part one about consumer trust. We touched on that briefly, um, but I wanted to ask you, how do you see the Green Claims proposal as restoring consumer trust in businesses' approach to sustainability? Consumer trust is indeed very low, and this is a big problem because we want to empower consumers to be part of the green transition. We will not reach our sustainability objectives without them. And uh, a very recent survey from the European Consumer Organization, BIRC, done in several EU countries, but also outside of the EU, in Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand, showed that three out of 10 respondents would feel less confident about green claims in general if a particular company was found guilty of displaying misleading information. This shows that companies engaging in greenwashing harm consumer trust well beyond their own company's reputation. And we now have an opportunity to restore this trust. The Green Claims Directive will ensure that environmental claims are properly substantiated, proving that what is claimed is significant from a life cycle perspective, that possible trade-offs between environmental impacts are taken into account, that companies use established scientific methods, use good quality and representative data to substantiate their statements. A very important added value of this proposal, which which will really work in, in the direction of restoring trust of consumers, is a new obligation on companies to verify the assessment behind the claims or labels before these claims or labels are presented to consumers. Mm -hmm. So this is a so-called ex-ante verification, which will be a powerful measure to eliminate these misleading claims from even appearing on the market. Mm -hmm. By the way, according to the Eurobarometer survey that uh, I mentioned in the previous um, part, 70% of respondents agreed that green claim and labels should only be authorized if pre-approved or verified. Obviously, this is not happening today on a regular basis. It's more like a best practice. Well, the consumers already have an expectation that this is happening. And I think we really have to respond to that expectation. This is yeah, super interesting. And it actually reminds me of a point that a uh, previous guest from this podcast, George Harding Roll, said. He said that, to, in his mind, greenwashing is anti-competitive. And the the study that you you talked about where, you know, when one company does greenwashing, it affects other companies absolutely shows that. I think, And I think it's interesting how so often greenwashing can happen because a company feels like it has to do better than its peers, you know, to show that it's more environmentally friendly when actually if it's, you know, if environmental claims are not communicated properly, not only is it going to affect your company, it's going to affect your peers as well. So that's very, very interesting. Absolutely. I, I will definitely be looking up those, those studies after this recording. So you mean you've also, this is obviously going to um, impact companies a lot. How do you see the EU Green Claims Directive helping level the playing field for companies? Um, well, I always like to repeat that this uh, legislation, this uh, this legal act, is not only meant to uh, protect consumers. It's also meant to protect businesses. And the level playing field is a very important uh, part of it. Um, we do recognize that many uh, businesses are actually making efforts to propose more sustainable goods, more sustainable services. And of course, we want them to talk about it because otherwise, why would they do it? They have to inform consumers about their offer and uh, they need to stand out uh, from, uh, from the competitors. And clearly, if we see many companies uh, being untruthful and greenwashing, that, of course, uh, causes a problem because these diligent companies that do their homework, they have to compete against those that do not. Um, and this is clearly where the European Green Claims Directive will aim to level, the level, uh, to level that uh, playing field. 
Let me highlight that, in fact, companies already today have to substantiate their claims. It's not that they can say whatever they like. The Unfair Commercial Practices Directive sets general rules on uh, on any commercial communication and stating that it should be based on facts and truth, truthful and also it should be uh, proven um, but the, the evidence should be shown only upon request. Um, and here, these rules are clearly not sufficient. Uh, that's why we are in a situation where we are today with so many unsubstantiated and, and in fact, uh, untrustful claims. So uh, we clearly have an area where we need to act to improve uh, that competitive situation. Thank you. Um... In your work leading this proposal, I would be interested to hear what kind of input that did companies and business associations have into the EU Green Claims Directive? Because obviously there are companies that are already, as you say, doing the homework, but for a lot of companies, you know, it's going to require a real sea change in how they communicate about these issues. So I'd be interested to hear about the input that companies provided and perhaps afterwards, more specifically, how will this impact SMEs, smaller companies uh, compared to medium and large sized businesses? Um, there was an extensive stakeholder consultation in preparation of this proposal, uh, of this proposal and also on the amendment to the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive that I have mentioned already. Uh, companies contributed with their experience on substantiation and communication of environmental claims, sharing the main challenges they have been facing on the EU market in terms of un un uneven level playing field. Um, Another problem has been the lack of more specific rules affecting legal certainty and the fact that consumer protection authorities interpreted these general rules in a divergent way. Um, so imagine for a company that is active on the EU market across different national markets, they, they make a claim and these claims may be accepted in one country but could be challenged in another. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, lack of transparency on the methods used to, to measure environmental impacts or to compare environmental performance of products and companies also led to misleading comparisons. So based on these inputs, we proposed the Green Claims Directive. We also consulted the stakeholders after the proposal was adopted. Uh, and the feedback we received from around 230 actors, uh, that feedback was transmitted to the European Parliament to the Council, by the way, for their consideration mm -hmm. in the current uh, discussions. There was a general support of the proposal with uh, three quarters of respondents endorsing the proposal as an essential step in the efforts to protect consumers and companies from greenwashing. Of course, people do have different preferences, different views, depending on the particular situations they're in. But overall, there is a need for this, uh, for th for this proposal and for the rules. And now when it comes to small and medium-sized enterprises and how, will, how this directive will impact them, um, the small and medium-sized enterprises are a very important part of the EU economy. In some sectors, SMEs are actually fully dominating. Mm -hmm. So they have to, to be subject to the requirements of the Green Claims Directive. Otherwise, we will never achieve a level playing field. And then we also want to make sure that these actors are part of the green transition. If they are left out completely of the regulatory landscape, that will not serve their competitiveness in the mid and long term either. However, we do acknowledge that the burden of substantiation and of verification uh, may affect the smallest SMEs proportionately more than larger actors, mm -hmm. while such microenterprises, they often act on a much smaller scale. Uh, to avoid this disproportionate impact, in our proposal, we propose that microenterprises, so companies employing fewer than 10 employees and with a, a, an annual turnover of less than 2 million euro, mm -hmm. that they can apply the requirements on substantiation communication on a voluntary basis if they wish to obtain a certificate of conformity. Uh, and that certificate of conformity is then recognized uh, by the competent authorities across the union. Uh, Microenterprises will not be exempt from the requirement on environmental labeling schemes, because in case they wish to operate such a scheme, it would be important that the scheme also complies with the requirements of this directive. 
Uh, but in order to encourage SMEs to participate in the green transition and favor um, the communication of legitimate environmental claims, um, we also require member states to take the appropriate measures to help SMEs apply the requirements uh, by, for example, providing facilitated access to measures such as financial support, organizational and technical assistance. The European Commission itself will also support companies by, for example, making available life cycle related data to support solid claims and to develop calculation uh, tools for small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, but then let me highlight that this does not mean a license for greenwashing for the small, smallest companies if they're exempt, because in fact, they are covered by the general rules of the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive in any case. So they still have to substantiate their claims. They have to base it on facts. It's just that we are less prescriptive how they should do it. Thank you. You mentioned there, uh, Margot Jatta, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, and they recently changed their rules on climate-related claims that companies will no longer be able to make. So can you explain this amendment in a bit more detail and uh, what it means for businesses? Yes, thank you for bringing this up, the Empowering Consumers for the Green Transition Amendment. Um, it's not yet voted, but it's already agreed uh, between the European Parliament and the Council. We're waiting for this formal step to happen, but we know what the text is. And in relation to greenwashing, the new law uh, requires, first of all, that all the voluntary sustainability labels are third party certified. So we are building on this requirement in the Green Claims Directive. An important novelty is that it is forbidding vague environmental claims called generic claims like green, environmentally friendly, sustainable, uh, because this is very generic. It's very difficult to say what it refers to and what actually this product does or what are the particular aspects of the product that make this statement correct. Um, so the statements like these are actually limited only to cases where the environmental excellent performance of the product or company uh, can be demonstrated, for example, on the basis of the EU eco-label mm -hmm. or similar eco-labels uh, developed uh, by, by the member states or, or acknowledged by the member states. Um, what is really important and I think very topical today is that companies will be no longer able to claim that their products are climate neutral or yes. carbon positive mm -hmm. based on greenhouse gas emission offsetting projects outside their value chain. Today, we see many such claims, carbon neutral water or carbon neutral organizations, carbon mm -hmm. neutral slides. What does mm -hmm. it mean? Uh, so the co-legislators decided that uh, such claims make consumers believe that uh, the product itself or the supply of the or the production of that product um, is uh, neutral uh, from the from the environmental perspective. Well, it's actually not true. I mean, these emissions still occur. It's just that the company purchased carbon offset credits uh, from uh, from other value chains. And bearing in mind the very recent scandals uh, that we read about concerning carbon offsets, um, it was pertinent to ensure that that consumers are not misled in this manner. But it does not mean that companies will not be able to make claims that they are contributing to other projects or even that they um, actually have ambitions for the future to reach climate neutrality. It's just that companies will have to be very transparent about it and openly communicate that at least part of this uh, will come from outside of the value chain, from carbon credits, uh, credits generated uh, in other activities. And the Green Claims Directive here will complement the, uh, this amendment to the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive by requiring this transparency and also requiring high integrity of carbon credits. Yes, I was nodding vigorously throughout your answer there, Margot Jatta, because yet yeah, we we've seen many examples of, you know, companies getting into trouble for making those carbon neutral claims. Studies that have come out which found that, you know, lots of companies who claim they're going to be net zero by twenty fifty or twenty thirty or whatever it is are relying far far too much on carbon offsets. So it's it's very good that this is being taken into consideration going forward. Absolutely. But here we also have to strike the right the right balance because mm -hmm. on one hand we do not want to mislead consumers, that's clear. Mm -hmm. 
on the other hand, we still want to allow these first movers, uh, those companies that, uh, that are trailblazers to set the pace for all the others and to be able to communicate about their ambitions and how they are going to reach these ambitions. So here again, uh, do not mislead the consumers, but yes, please be ambitious and talk about it, but make sure that you have a clear implementation plan, that you have targets underlying your ambition, that you will be reporting about these targets um, on a regular basis, how you're reaching to that ambition. So here again, an important balance uh, that the regulators had to find uh, on ensuring that we, we have sticks, but we also have carrots. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very good point because, yeah, absolutely, we don't want to mis- mislead consumers because the issues in in those cases would be that consumers would really think that if they purchased a certain flight or bought a certain product, it wasn't just that it was environmentally friendly. It was almost, in some cases, like they were contributing to helping stop yeah, climate change, which is uh, obviously not the case. But you're absolutely correct that, you know, um, especially in this environment where companies know they need to be more environmentally friendly, but don't always know how to go about it. Being able to have those trailblazers set the pace, as you say, is very important. Throughout these two episodes, you've mentioned that independent verification or third party certification will be crucial in future. So companies must prove the factual basis for their green claims and that this proposal places the responsibility on businesses rather than on consumers. So can I just ask, can you go into perhaps just a little bit more detail on what this means exactly? So what assessment do companies need to undertake to ensure that they do their homework properly? Yes, that's uh, that's an important topic, and uh, I, I'm happy you're asking this question. Um, our regulatory landscape today is that uh, when companies want to make claims in their commercial communication, they have to follow some rules. But in the end, if a consumer or a consumer protection authority feels that there is a problem, that the consumers are misled, um, they have to uh, assess these claims on a case-by-case basis. And consumer authorities have to demonstrate that the commercial practice had a negative impact on the consumer via, for example, uh, a transactional decision test, a so-called transactional decision test that consumers would have taken another decision if they would not have been confronted by that unfair commercial practice. This is often difficult to prove, requires a lot of effort and evidence from the consumers and consumer protection authorities, and which may not necessarily have the resources or the necessary technical expertise to prove it. Mm-hmm. So the Green Claims Directive, in fact, reverses that burden. With the ex-ante verification, we require that companies that want to make claims demonstrate that this claim will be substantiated in line with the rules of our directive, and therefore that the claim is based on reliable information. It will be for the ex-ante verifier, will be an accredited conformity assessment body to check the substantiation and to issue a certificate of conformity uh, in case the assessment is compliant with the rules. Um, Our general rules already require today that claims are substantiated, uh, but once the misleading claim is out there and it's communicated to consumers, it is close to impossible to fully retract the harm made. Mm -hmm. And some consumers may never realize they had been misled, may repeat similar purchasing pattern in the future based on the information they received previously. With the example verification, we are actually preventing these misleading claims from making it to consumers. Note that a similar approach has already been applied in other area, health and nutritional claims, mm-hmm. with a great effect. So we are really basing ourselves here on, on a good, uh, good practice uh, in another uh, regulatory area. And now what should companies do to ensure they do their homework properly? Mm -hmm. Uh, Excellent question. This is the core of our proposal. We are setting rules um, uh, that companies have to prepare a robust assessment of their claims. So what do they do? They have to use verified and scientifically robust methods. They should base their assessments on standards developed by standardization bodies when they exist. We also want companies to take a life cycle perspective, and this is very important. Mm -hmm. Maybe the fact that there is a negligible share of recycled plastic in a laptop brings almost no benefits to the environmental performance of that product, because in fact, the real impacts result from other parts of that product. They occur somewhere else. So it would not be appropriate to focus only on the production stage 
um, if in fact most of the environmental impacts occur at the stage when raw materials are exploited? Or is it fair to only talk about carbon emissions during the use phase of a product when most of these emissions occur at the production stage? That's why taking a life cycle perspective is so important. So, uh, thirdly, we also want companies to use high quality data. So do inquire within your value chain with your suppliers, be demanding as it will drive positive change more quickly if you require from your suppliers to also be part of that change. Uh, if one wants to make a comparative claim, be sure to base the comparisons on the same assumptions, use the same method to ensure comparability, make sure to consider for products using different raw materials or production processes all the relevant life cycle stages. For example, extraction of oil will be relevant for conventional plastics, while agriculture and forestry will be more relevant for bio-based plastics. So all of this should be taken into account in comparisons. So the ex ante verification will allow us to introduce this rigor, create best practice for companies. And let me mention that our own European methodology, the environmental footprint methods developed with a wide involvement of scientific community and with a heterogeneous group of stakeholders are an appropriate method to substantiate claims about environmental impacts and environmental footprint. The method is already widely applied and we are working on improving it further to make it applicable to a wide range of claims in different product categories. So we do have tools already to do the, the, the assessment, the substantiation in line with our requirements. Thank you for your detailed answer. Yeah, I think it's for me uh, as a communicator, it, it seems so clear that life cycle assessment is so important. But what is interesting, I think, is that maybe not all consumers yet know about it. So I think that's a conversation for another podcast, you know, how to uh, how to raise the awareness of LCAs with consumers so they can really understand where the main impacts of the products that they're buying come from. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A related and important question for you, and I think uh, one that a lot of our listeners will be thinking, what do you estimate the cost of this work will be for companies? Of course, that's a question that keeps on coming back. Companies mm -hmm. are worried that it will become more difficult and more expensive to make environmental claims. But as said before, the obligation to substantiate claims is already there. It's just that its general nature makes it difficult to apply. So the cost will largely depend on the complexity of an environmental claim to be made. The more complex it is, the more expensive it gets because you need more data, more evidence. But we estimated that for simple claims about materials used in production, it could be several hundred euros. While for complex claims and environmental footprint of a product, it could be around eight to 10,000 euros. While a claim about the whole organization is, is, is yet another range of costs, it could even cost, to, cost even up to 50,000 euros. But companies can control this cost. It's up to them to decide what claim they want to make, what assessment they're prepared to make. And let's not forget, we are not talking about mandatory provisions of information, but rather voluntary statements. How, how much money do companies spend on marketing if they hire a celebrity to advertise their products? It's, it's way, way higher in terms of costs than, than what we are requiring here in the Green Claims Directive. And when it comes to the cost of verification, it will again largely depend on the complexity of the claim. So again, companies do control these costs. Thank you, Margarita. To finish up, I wanted to ask you, so the legislation also sets requirements for companies' level of transparency, which, you know, as you say, is, is voluntary as well. What message do you have for companies who have whether consciously or unconsciously, been guilty of greenwashing in the past. So what do you think they should prioritize or change in this new era of transparency on sustainability? Our requirements are based on best practice. So my first, uh, my first advice would be use best practice. Look what other companies out there are doing, especially those that are, uh, as I said, trailblazers, those that, that do take uh, their responsibility seriously. Um, I would say respect your consumer. I mean, your consumer, if you want 
uh, to, to build a relationship of trust. And if you want your consumer to buy your products on a regular basis, you have to respect uh, your consumer and be truthful and, and, and convey messages that are uh, reliable. It does not pay off to risk your reputation end of the day, as, as, as we have discussed uh, previously. And then finally, my, I think, best piece of advice is offer more sustainable products and services. Consumers want to buy them. It's a huge market opportunity. Do innovate, look at, uh, at, at the best available techniques that are out there, think about alternative business models to really facilitate more sustainable consumption. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Margot Thank you for joining us today for part two. And thank thanks- you very much. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Thank you. Um, and thanks to our listeners. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to this podcast series and explore the entire catalogue of podcast programming from the Conference Board by visiting our website at tcb.org forward slash podcasts. See you next time.